What's going on and welcome back FUD Nation. Again, I apologize for not having as consistent content. I've been extremely, extremely busy these last couple of days, but I promise we have some great things coming up for you this week. So sit tight, we're gonna get to all of that. But today we have a very special interview with none other than Simon Dixon. He is nothing short, he is nothing short of a Bitcoin pioneer, publishing one of the first ever books on Bitcoin called Bank to the Future back in 2011, and was actually a speaker at the very first Bitcoin conference. We have an amazing chat about everything involved with the cryptocurrency movement, and he explains his ambitious project where he's going to allow you to get a hold of equity in such amazing companies as Ripple, Coinbase, and more. So if you're interested in how you can potentially get your own shares in some of the most explosive fintech companies in the world, then you're going to want to watch this entire interview. Strap in FUD Nation, get ready. This is my exclusive interview with Simon Dixon. Thank you so much for coming on the channel, Simon Dixon. Uh, welcome to FUD TV, FUD Nation, let's give him a very warm welcome. And just for those who are not completely acquainted with you and your background, could you please give the FUD TV audience just a little bit of background on how you came into the cryptocurrency space and you know, essentially how you developed your career into working within this very interesting and very exciting new area of financial technology? Sure, yeah. So um, I say I'm a, a finance guy that found technology. So I was originally... Um, well, edu by education, an economist, and then I went into the investment banking world, spent a few years as a trader, then working in corporate finance, taking companies public. Um, but uh, I was very dissatisfied with uh, economics when I, when I studied it. Um, and after getting a few years in the, working in the investment bank, I got itchy and wanted to actually return to some of my um, studies because I was very dissatisfied with some of the things they were teaching in economics. Um, and so in 2006, I decided to throw in the corporate towel and spend my life giving lectures around the world on the challenges of money and the financial system. Um, and the funny thing was, is nobody cared because we were in one of the biggest bull markets in history. Um, and, uh, but then the financial crisis happened, and I guess a little bit of timing. Um, when the financial crisis happened, more and more people wanted to attend my talk. And uh, I was very fortunate to actually bump into... Um, a, a guy called uh, Johnny Bitcoin at one of my talks I was giving. Um, and Johnny Bitcoin was, uh, he was, he, he, he had actually just moved into a squat in Old Street, sold his house, and was living with some of the very early Bitcoin developers in London. Um, and uh, he actually was part of the, the movement. It was the monetary reform movement that we were kind of working with at the time. Um, and uh, got invited to speak at the very first Bitcoin conference in the world. So, um, when I spoke there, I came from the perspective of a, a finance guy that was talking about problems of money um, and listened to, there was probably about 40 people in the room. Half of them were computer science geeks. The others were anarchists. Um, and I, you know, and it was a very, very interesting to uh, further it because I was writing a book at the time called Bank to the Future, which actually turned out um, a, a little claim to fame that not many people know, uh, was one of the, the first published books in the world that included Bitcoin. Um, and so well, that's, amazing. that's how I got into crypto. That's amazing. Uh, your story is actually really fascinating. And I always love talking to people who have seen the movement develop over many years, because when you only have the perspective of the last 6, 12, 18, 24 months, uh, there's just a lot that y you might feel towards the movement of cryptocurrency and Bitcoin, where if you've been part of it for the better part of 10 years, you have a, probably a different perspective about the different movements and projects and, and trends and fads within the industry. Um, but before we get into all that, I want to unpack a few things you said. Uh, one was that you had a big problem with money itself. And I think this is something that as you sort of venture down the path of cryptocurrency land and, and really start to understand more about these technologies, you also start to understand a lot more about money. So could you tell the audience just a little bit about what exactly about money uh, you found so, I guess, uh, interesting or you found very, uh, you, you found the need to discuss it as if there was big problems here? Because I think this is one of the critical aspects of at least the Bitcoin movement that people really need to understand. Sure, yeah. So, um, you know, part of my work um, is I've been trying to make complex financial and economic things um, simple for people, everyday people to understand. Um, and um, the, the, when, when I wrote the book, Bank to the Future, and started talking um, on this topic, um, I pointed out three things that uh, are going to be the cause of 
our entire financial system collapsing eventually, um, or they're going to require some financial engineering to fix, and they'll keep trying to have to do financial engineering until eventually we have to completely reform the system. Um, but those three things were, and this is you can I can probably tie this into Bitcoin why I got so excited when I went to that conference. Um, is that when you deposit your money at a bank, the bank is actually the legal owner of that money. Um, and uh, when I was trying to explain this to people at the time, it was a very hard thing for people to appreciate and understand. Um, but when Bitcoin came around, people started to actually really get a real life example of what the difference is between owning your own money and not owning your own money. Um, and so the you know with with a bank, I think the av the average everyday person doesn't really feel the hard effects of actually not owning your money. But when you actually generate wealth and try to move wealth, you realize how little you actually own your money. Because most of the time, if the bank firstly doesn't like the way that you're trying to spend that money, um, then you have to explain it away until it can actually move. Um, and if they really don't like the way you're spending that money, then they can just use it to either um, bail themselves out, bail themselves in, um, or actually just keep it because they think it's a suspicious transaction. Um, and this is one of the frictions around um, not owning your own money. So Bitcoin took that away and it gave everyone the ability to own their own value. Um, you know, cash has done this in the past, gold has done this in the past, but it did a few things differently that made it even more intriguing. Uh, the second thing is that when you deposit your money at the bank, when the bank becomes the owner of the money, they actually spend it as they wish. And so I was talking about um, the economic effects of banks actually dictating how people spend their money. Um, and that is that uh, because they own it, um, they have a license to spend it and lend it again. Um, and when they lend it out, they are actually dict dictating where 97% of all the money in our economy flows. And so uh, because banks like to take your money and lend it to the least risky but highest return thing, um, you get a massive skewing in the economy towards real estate and property. Um, and so the, the entire you know, banking system is designed to put more and more property, more and more money into the property system, which is why property prices go up. It's because the bank has decided that uh, if they take, you know, uh, property doesn't run, real estate doesn't run away. Um, and uh, it is actually, they can repossess it and resell it if it goes wrong. Mm -hmm. And so this makes a massive skew in the economy. Um, towards the, the, the property market. Um, but what Bitcoin did is it came along and said, well, we can't actually take, if, if we can't own your money, then we can't spend it, and you can spend it as you want person to person. Um, and so this, you know, these are the first two things. And then the third one was a, it's a bit more geeky, a bit more economic, but actually one of the most transformative things about Bitcoin, and that is the way that money is actually created. Um, and this was a bit that people did find hard to believe, um, because most people think a central bank creates money. Um, the fact is that a central bank creates about 3% of the money. The most is created, the rest is created by a private bank. And the way that it's created is by finding more people to borrow it. So every time someone, a bank issues a loan, new money gets created and you get an increase in the money supply. As that money is repaid, you get a decrease in the money supply. So if you want to have economic growth and you want to increase the money, you have to increase the money supply. If you want to increase the money supply, you either have to find people, government, or corporations to borrow it. And this creates an economy whereby you're continually trying to increase the money supply by finding more and more people to borrow it. And as you increase the money supply, the value of the existing money goes down, and you get this thing called inflation, and therefore the central bank manipulates interest rates in order to create boom-bust cycle, boom-bust cycle, where they're encouraging people to take on debt, and then punishing them by sending them bankrupt uh, by increasing the interest rate. Um, and so you have this crazy economy um, and you know, trying to get very complex subjects into something quite simple, where essentially the sensible thing for the average person to do is borrow as much as possible and default on that debt and not save. And if you do that, then you'll do very well in the traditional fiat um, system, um, and it encourages mass, mass, mass debt. Um, the opposite is true in Bitcoin. Bitcoin came along and created um, this the, the world's first digital uh, value that you can own, that you can spend, and that has a fixed supply based upon a monetary policy that anyone can understand and is very simple, and eventually is a finite fixed money supply. Um, and so it creates a, a natural scarcity. 
um, whereby it's independent of any government's agenda, any central bank's agenda, and any country's agenda. So while a traditional country might optimize um, for the goals of their country, the money supply of Bitcoin doesn't care about any country. It doesn't care about anything. It's just simple math and code. Um, and it's uh, so what, what I saw in this is this crazy little experiment that looked very unlikely to succeed, but actually solved the three things that I was trying to point out as problems in banking, that government, central banks, and the banking system has no desire to fix. Um, and so that's really what, what got me into Bitcoin and got me into this from a monetary financial perspective to begin with. Thank you for that. And you obviously covered a lot of ground there. I'm going to do my best to unpack that just to dumb it down a little bit here is essentially, you know, the control over the monetary supply, the control over you touching your own funds and the way that money is created are the sort of core aspects of, of problems with traditional money. And these things are very centralized. And essentially, you have these central bodies making decisions that impact everybody's lives. Uh, and most likely, you're seeing that as not necessarily in the interest of the greater public. And so I think that those things, as you're saying, are solved by Bitcoin. Uh, and I really I appreciate that. And obviously, for those uh, who are new to the sort of Bitcoin ideology, this is sort of one of the core underpinnings is is access control and decentralization over the money supply. So thanks for that. Um, I do want to shift a little bit and talk. You've now seen the movement develop since 2010 or 11, correct? Yep. So what did you see Bitcoin as originally and has that changed? Like, what did you see as the use case for Bitcoin and has that changed in any way? Uh, has it uh, evolved? Has it transformed with, you know, obviously the developments of other coins, altcoin markets, ICOs, etc.? What do you think has been the, the life cycle of Bitcoin? So uh, I've seen in that time about six different, I guess you could call them investment waves and trends that... Um, you know, have really, I mean, most people in their lifetime, you know, they, they, they experience something like a tech boom and bust or something like that, or they experience a great depression or a financial crisis or something. And you only tend to get one of those in your life. Um, in the time that I've been involved in crypto, I've seen about six of those things um, of like ultra high return, crazy um, things that have actually, uh, you know, emerged and, and been involved with. So I've never seen anything that moves at the pace of, this industry and there's never a dull moment or ball or, or boring moment in crypto. Um, but uh, when when I originally saw, so the first really investment thesis that I invested into was the potential for Bitcoin to actually be the best shot the world has ever seen at being sound money. Mm -hmm. And the only difference between that today and in the beginning was that it was a lot less likely to succeed in the beginning. And today I think it's a lot more likely to succeed. Um, in the beginning, it was very, very, you know, uncertain whether this could actually ever happen, whether it could be allowed. You know, we had genuine, the things that people talk about, you know, as, as objections to Bitcoin right now were real, real, real objections back then. Mm -hmm. You know, we thought a government could just shut this down in a second. Um, you know, all of the objections that you've heard over the years. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, but Bitcoin just survived. <laughs> Um, and it's amazing that it's got this far, and it, it, it truly is a, it, it's a, a remarkable and one of the most exciting things that I've ever seen, that it is actually still here today. And now to the point where I think it's irreversible, which is just such an exciting thing. Um, but I talked about those six things. So the first one was Bitcoin and the potential to create an exit to the traditional financial system, the world's best shot at achieving found money, um, and having an independent financial system that is is you know independent of politics and government um the second thing that kind of came along is i started investing in bitcoin companies um and uh we were accumulating equity i you know i'll probably talk about it later but um i started an investment platform called bank to the um and the whole point of that platform was i knew that finance was changing i just didn't know which companies were going to succeed in making that change happen mm -hmm. um and the great thing about bitcoin is it never needed any marketing all it did is once it existed, uh, companies came along and, great, and and created things to make it more usable uh, for people to use. So um, I, want, I, I had a, a theory that uh, the future of finance is going to look very different from the past. Didn't know which companies were going to succeed, and I wanted to diversify across all of them. So I spent a lot of time taking some of those Bitcoin returns and investing in equity and in companies 
and making it accessible for, for people to actually diversify widely. Um, and, uh, you know, a good handful of those uh, are now unicorn companies from Coinbase to uh, Kraken to Bitstamp to Bitfinex and uh, many others in between. The shapeshift and quite a few that in the gone so, throughout cycle. So when did you buy your first Bitcoin? What was the uh, what was the year? At the conference, um, November two thousand eleven, the uh, the Bitcoin uh, Bitcoin crashed to three dollars during the conference. And and what did you buy it as? What did you buy it at? Uh, it, there was um, a, there was something called a Cassius coin at the time, which is a coin that actually held Bitcoin. Um, in like a little nice thing and uh, there was a peer-to-peer -peer transaction there and there was this coin had five bitcoins on it um, and it was $25 I believe for the for the coin at the time um, and so that was when when um, it was actually uh, my wife who was uh, there and she was really really um, intrigued by the people at the conference and mm -hmm. so she made that purchase so you saw, so you you found yourself in a room of forty anarchists and computer geeks in a what you describe as a crack den, and you said to yourself, "This is good. This is where I should be sticking my money." Yeah, um, because the, the, it was the, you know the, these people got, um, and you know I came at the, most of these people were tech guys, anarchists, but I was coming out as a finance guy, um, and uh, you know the, the, this industry seemed to be. Solving some of the things, you know, at the time I actually wanted to try and create a bank, um, and uh, I wanted to try and create what was called a non-fractional reserve bank, which is a full reserve bank. Um, and we were fighting with regulators. We spent years uh, trying to get this through, um, and the regulators we were pitching at the time they were basically saying, "Well, you have to hire a CEO that's got experience at a traditional bank, and they wanted you to recreate banking, and they didn't want you to do any of the." you know, the practices that make banking more sustainable because they couldn't see the profit in it. Mm -hmm. um, but then I saw these people at Bitcoin come along and essentially create this thing. I was very unfamiliar with open source and decentralization or any of these concepts. Um, but I saw this code that seemed to be attracting, you know, a, a, great, a great deal of attention around it um, that would allow people to build technology on top of it. Um, and actually circumvent the banking system altogether. And so, you know, m my wife was talking about, you know, we spent so much time trying to fight and change from within and deal with politics and regulators and bankers, and none of them are interested in making any change. But this group of people were just circumventing that system, and it just seems like a lot faster and the path of least resistance. So I started investing in companies uh, around that. Yeah. Um, and that was the second wave. So we had Bitcoin, we had equity, uh, then lots of people tried to fork Bitcoin and create their own versions and create altcoins. Um, the word altcoin is a bit of a misleading concept today mm -hmm. because then it really was just we're trying to create an alternative to Bitcoin. And they inevitably always failed because they were more, you know, they, they were created by a promoter and it required someone to promote it. Um, or they were just straight up scams or people were just trying to scam people out of their money. Um, or they were learning the hard way that Bitcoin is actually uh, very, very hard to replicate and achieve again. And it was actually a very freak experiment at a time when nobody cared, um, that actually, um, which is actually has built many properties that are hard to replicate. So then, but they, they still created ultra high return opportunities. Um, you know, the pumps and dumps were born um, and you had this altcoin wave and a few of them, you know, you had things like Litecoin that survived out of that. So, um, so you, you touched on some a very interesting topic there that I really care strongly about uh, because I see these nuances between uh, lots of different uh, quote unquote altcoins. And there is a, you know, there, I think the word cryptocurrency can tend to be misleading because the original uh, coin, Bitcoin, is like you're saying, intended to be sound money or currency. But you have a lot of these new coins, a lot of these new projects that, you know, from a digital, from a from a sort of 30,000 foot perspective, they're traded on a blockchain very similarly to Bitcoin. But of course, their goals are, you know, tremendously different. And the variety is, is uh, in my opinion, so tremendous that you can't really even classify them as the same types of assets. Um, could you tell me a little bit about how you've seen this development and where you see the lines being drawn between the different types of altcoins? Because I think that's something that we as content creators need to shine a light on um, because I hear a lot about comparisons between uh, different types of projects that, in my opinion, aren't competitors in, in the slightest. 
Yeah, so, um, and this really ties into the, the, the next three waves that kind of came from it, um, was um, there was a lot of talk around um, the Bitcoin community wanting to um, create assets and uh, stocks and various different things um, because they saw this thing called, um, you know, the blockchain. Um, and uh, there was a lot of talks around different things you could do with it. Um, and uh, one project that emerged was something called Mastercoin. Mm -hmm. um, and colored coins, and then something called counterparty after that. So those were the first three attempts at really trying to take the Bitcoin blockchain and allow people to do different things with it. Um, and that was create assets that would live on top of Bitcoin and use the Bitcoin blockchain as the ledger. Um, and there was a, there were quite a few projects that used that technology. So we invested in some, like there was Mastercoin, which was the first protocol that tried to do that. Um, then there were things like... Um, storage which is still around today but it was originally built upon mastercoin the, the the bitcoin blockchain and made safe and various other decentralized projects that were trying to adapt what might actually come out of this industry um, but it wasn't until uh vitalik actually started um pitching to the bitcoin community um this project called ethereum um and i remember uh i was working on bank to the future at the time working on the regulations for allowing people to invest in equity online and this guy called uh, Gavin Wood came down and he was t telling us about this project called Ethereum. Um, and uh, yeah, really, uh, you know, and, and then the Bitcoin community funded it. So they did this first, well, I think it was about the fourth or fifth, I can't remember the exact time, I was ICO at the time. Um, and they came up with this word called smart contracts from Nick Zabos, um paper and work on smart contracts. Uh, and really, it was very speculative. It was funded by the Bitcoin community. Um, and there was no, you know, this friction between that we see today between Ethereum, Bitcoin and these things didn't really exist. I remember when, the, you know, when we invested in the ICO, you got like this JSON file and it was very much, uh, you know, it was uh, no one really knew what to do with that stuff. It was very geeky. Mm -hmm. um, and they almost went bankrupt because we were in the last bear market as well. And it was all funded by the Bitcoin community. The Bitcoin price crashed from about 1,250 to 250, um, and Ethereum almost never got created. Mm -hmm. um, but then it did get created, um, and uh, you know that created the next kind of. I was investing in uh, Ethereum mining at the time, um, which was a you know a very successful investment. Um, and um, then uh, yeah, it, it took like about one or two years. Um, but it turned out that the user case of smart contracts, which created the next wave, which was ICOs. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, ICOs was just a real big shocker to me uh, because um, we'd worked so hard on securities laws. Um, I'd spent pretty much all my entrepreneurial time. Um, you know, at Bank to the Future, we were the first three platforms in the world to allow people to invest online. And we were spent four years lobbying regulators to allow it to happen. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, in the UK was where the first, um, you know, it was first allowed. It was called equity crowdfunding at the time. Um, and then later, America took that work that we were doing in the UK and created this thing called the Jobs Act about three years later mm -hmm. to allow people to invest online. And then suddenly all this work was done. Um, and, you know, we, we built banksofthefuture.com where people were investing in the equity of all these companies I was talking about. Um, and in 2017, we started to get disrupted by the, all these tokens. Um, and so we had this, 2017 was a very confusing time um, but we, the market cap of our industry, you know, went up to a peak of almost about 800 million at the time. Um, so it was a really, really fascinating, interesting time. Um, but that created, so, you know, just in summary, you had Bitcoin sound money, you had equity in the companies that were creating all the exchanges and infrastructure that built this ultra high return industry in 2017. Uh, you had altcoins that were trying to create alternatives to Bitcoin. Then you had Ethereum, which was, I'd say, the foundation of the smart contract and then disruption in capital markets. Uh, the fifth one was when you had ICOs. And then the final one we'll probably get in um, is uh, security tokens, which is the next one, which hasn't started yet, uh, or is just getting started right now. Um, so sorry if I'm giving you really long answers, but there's a lot to cover in, uh, in that no. question.
I appreciate it. There's a lot going on there, and that's good to know your your history as being on the forefront of almost a lot of these movements without even intending to be, right? You are sort of on the forefront of explaining money, and then Bitcoin comes along and, and presents solutions that you didn't actually anticipate to your issues with the monetary system. Then you have, you know, you're out there trying to create a mechanism by which to invest online, and all of a sudden we get the ICO, uh, you know, explosion. And, you know, still to this date, the world is trying to figure out uh, where the line is. Uh, as to what a token that you can sell versus you can't sell. Um, and there's been a sort of, I guess, a resounding opaqueness from the uh, from the governments as to what, what that line is, but we're still looking to find it. And it'll be very interesting to see where that uh, sort of buck stops. And then, of course, now you're looking at a full transition to just tokenizing these securities that exist other places, which is, of course, we, where we find ourselves is on the brink, you know, at the at the water's edge of a whole new movement of taking things that were, you know, previously very illiquid and previously very hard to transfer and trade and making them extraordinarily liquid and easy to transfer around um, within certain environments. And of course, I think that there's been a lot of hype. I would call it an extraordinarily hyped topic, STOs. And, you know, what I try to communicate to my audience is that, you know, uh, if you're not an accredited investor and you're not necessarily an expert in this space or that space, security tokens are not going to present a very safe sort of alternative investment uh uh, environment, but they rather could also present a very risky investment environment where now you're having access to a whole lot of investments that you didn't have access to before, but they might even have, uh, you know, inflated uh, valuations due to the uh, the price discovery of, of having a global market, as well as they don't have that asymmetric profile. Like when you're looking at cryptocurrencies, you can invest $10 and make a thousand uh, in some, in some, I'm sure you've experienced a similar gains if you bought a $5 Bitcoin. Uh, that there's actually that possibility. Whereas with a real estate investment or a stock that's being traded on the stock market, the chance of having a 10 or 100x is, is sort of like, you know, non-existent, but you could also lose your money. Yeah, so we've kind of um, found ourselves in today and, you know, I've got to be very careful because the thinking goes so outdated within a three month period within this industry. Three months is like five years in our industry. Um, but we found ourselves today in a situation where we're kind of at a crossroads. Um, and I've been at quite a few of these because, you know, people talk about the 2017 ICO like it came out of nowhere. But people don't remember that that was actually being built from around about 2012. Yeah. And it took about five years till we got 2017. But in 2017, it looked like this overnight phenomenon that just came from nowhere. Um, and I think it's the same with security tokens. Um, and I think the, it's going to touch upon so many interesting issues just like you talked about and all we can do is come up with our best thinking but we're kind of at a stage right now where you've got three different types of things within the industry um, and this is the way that i'm looking at it with my current thinking and my current in investing um, well four really you've got the equity the equity has just been a solid consistent performer actually um, it hasn't been disrupted um, and it's been pretty bulletproof throughout this whole um, disruption um, and, and trends but you've got these things that um, there is a very good case that they're not securities. Mm -hmm. um, and that is, you know, protocol level, um, decentralized, you know, it, it's a very hard thing to debate. So see, Bitcoin is Bitcoin. It, there isn't, in my opinion, there's never going to be another Bitcoin. It's the world's best shot at achieving sound money. We're never going to happen again. No one's going to replicate it again. Um, and it's going to create so much good um, in my perspective. Um, when the world adjusts to the massive challenges in the traditional financial system. That one is done. I think it's very hard to compete with. Um, but there is definitely a case for these different types of disruptions in capital markets, different products. Um, and, you know, the type of thing, the type of decisions you would make in building sound money, like a fixed money supply, are not right for a protocol that's going to create disruption in capital markets. You'd actually want um, Ethereum to be cheap um, mm -hmm. if it's actually going to be used for payment for smart contracts. You wouldn't want it to be a good investment. Um, and you do actually want it to be inflationary in order to achieve that. Mm -hmm. um, but that's the opposite of trying to compare it to something like Bitcoin and sound money. Um, and people get this very confused. Still to this day, um, you know, people find this, this, this thing very different. Um, but there is an opportunity to you know, invest in protocols. 
Um, and the opportunity is there to create ultra high returns. Um, no one knows which ones are going to succeed. At the moment, at this time of recording, um, you know, everyone was talking about how Bitcoin's, a, you know, uh, this time last year, Bitcoin's a pile of crap. It's absolute rubbish. Ethereum is faster, cheaper, better. Um, and now Ethereum is a pile of crap. It's a load of old rubbish. And EOS is faster, cheaper, better. And Tron is faster, cheaper, better. And Cardano is faster, cheaper, better. Um, and there will be lots of others that are faster, cheaper, better. So, so, um, so, so I want to chime in here because I think you're you're touching on something that I like to illustrate for my audience, which is uh, Bitcoin wants to be sound money, and EOS, Tron, and Ethereum, uh, Cardano, these are competing for a different uh, use case, which is like you're saying, disrupting capital markets. But I also think that they're trying to host essentially, you know, decentralized internet products as well, which is, to me, one of the most exciting things about this is, you know, peer-to-peer uh, -peer versions of products that we've fallen in love with, like Uber, like Airbnb, like these ways that you can directly interface uh, with other users in a secure environment, um, use the blockchain where it benefits that experience. And then, of course, um, you know, what you want is a fast and user-friendly experience. So speed really matters. Whereas with sound money or store of value, uh, having the transfer happen immediately um, on the primary layer of the blockchain could arguably be not even something you'd, you'd want necessarily because it might jeopardize security and, and all these other things. And so uh, can you talk a little bit about what you see as the difference between you know, the, the platforms, uh, I call them, and the, you know, the currencies like Bitcoin? Yeah, I mean, you know, you, that, that is it, really. Um, Bitcoin is, um, it's really important for that to be as decentralized as it can possibly be. Now, many people will say, well, it's got centralized mining or it's got centralized development. But what Bitcoin history has proved is that we've got pockets of centralization within the ecosystem. But uh, there's case study after case study showing when miners try to exercise too much influence over the industry, and they failed miserably, mm -hmm. um, even though they might control a large, a large chunk of the mining power. Uh, businesses tried to collude and get together at a conference and get the block size increased because it was important for their business uh, because the transaction fees were eating them alive. Um, and they tried to collude and take over the development, mm -hmm. but they failed miserably. Mm -hmm. um, developers tried to actually, you know, try to control the ecosystem and think that we know what's best uh, for Bitcoin. But, um, and users have tried to do that as well. But what you've got is this fight between developers, miners, media, users, businesses. And that is why it's decentralized. Nothing else has that um, at this stage. And so that's why it's the world best shot at sound money plus the monetary policy. Yep. You know, it's designed to be reward the saver, scarce. And as long as more people find more reasons to use Bitcoin and want to use their own money, spend their own money, own their own money, then it will reward the saver through an increase in price over time as it becomes more scarce. More of them get lost, um, and they become more and more rare and more and more valuable. Um, then you've got uh, people trying to create these things called decentralized applications. So far, um, I've only seen a few that have succeeded. I'm not really into games, mm -hmm. but I think there seems to be something going on in gaming. It's mm -hmm. not really my interest. I'm a finance guy. Um, gambling certainly seems to be getting, you know, some attention in this decentralized application world. But the one that really is, um, is tokenization, which leads into securities, derivatives, assets, and all sorts of mm -hmm. stuff, disruption, venture capital. So far, those three there. Now, the rest, the jury's out. If someone does create a decentralized Uber, and that does actually genuinely improve the user experience um, and does benefit from decentralization, um, we don't know yet. That's a speculation that mm -hmm. someone's trying to create. And if you invest in the token that achieves that, then you will be rewarded accordingly. Um, and then finally, you're just going to get the, it's going to be lower return. Um, and we're not sure where it's going to go, but it's going to be, you know, tokens that are, are sold in compliance with securities laws um, and have to adhere to, you know, many of the securities laws and that is the security token. So that's kind of where we are right now. We've got these three things. You've got protocol, you've got existing tokens that have use case with a scarcity because there probably won't be any more ITOs outside of the protocol level. Um, and then you've got the security tokens where everyone's going to be selling these different um, products in compliance with securities laws. Everyone's looking for you know the use case where they can actually do things faster, cheaper, better. Mm -hmm. um, and what we've seen is that the more centralized you get, the more you can actually achieve that. 
And so you've got different layers of centralization that are coming in there. So you've got someone like EOS that kind of says, well, we can have the public blockchain, but if we want to achieve optimizations of um, faster, cheaper, better, then we're going to suffer some layer of centralization. Mm -hmm. But that might actually be the one that actually gets the attention in the end, um, because one would you know, ask is, how decentralized do you need these things to be? Mm -hmm. um, and then you've got, you know, things like, I, I think Ethereum's worst enemy was obviously the DAO, uh, where it proves that a load of people that were around Ethereum lost a load of money in an investment opportunity, and then Ethereum decided to look after their mates and create a hard fork um, that actually, you know, reversed the trade and therefore prove that they're not quite Bitcoin. Yeah. Um, but Ethereum is, you know, calling it not decentralized is slightly misleading because you know, um, it's certainly more decentralized than some of the things that are coming after. Um, and uh, you've got kind of like, you know, it's, it's a spectrum as mm -hmm. opposed to a, a stamp of, of yeah, what I, it is. Yeah, I, I agree. And you can argue decentralization on so many levels or centralization on so many levels. I just wanted to get your, uh, your analysis on how you see that, because I've heard that argument made. I'm not saying that's my position. I'm saying that I, uh, I've heard that argument made that centralization uh, of Ethereum uh, happens at various levels. Uh, and then, of course, you bring up an interesting thing about EOS, right, which is... Well, just, uh, just, to, just to interrupt, if Ethereum was meant to be sound money, uh, then it's certainly far too centralized to achieve that goal, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was more referring to your discussion around securities law and, and you know, obviously uh, by letting Ethereum continue to do its thing, it sort of opens up a whole host of questions for the, for the, the, the line at which something uh, becomes a security if, you know, like you're seeing very clearly, Ethereum can inflate in value uh, absolutely dramatically. So, um, you know, it's, it's definitely uh, a lot of people would consider it a phenomenal investment, Ethereum. So it, it then begs the, begs the question of, of what is it, even though it in some ways is decentralized, in some ways is controlled by a small group of, of central actors, uh, as you're seeing with the Ethereum Foundation. Um, but I wanted to move on a little bit to what you said about EOS and how, you know, it very well might be the winning, be the winner because, well, how decentralized do you need these things to be? And I think that's an interesting question of, from an ideological standpoint, looking forward to towards total decentralization as an ideal and how that's great for Bitcoin. But then you're looking at, you know, powering decentralized applications. And the question is, at which point are you, you know, uh, you know, exponentially more secure than a centralized server, but you're making a compromise to serve the end user because the end user has become accustomed to a certain level of functionality. Um, and I think that's an interesting debate that essentially we're going to see play out over the next sort of few years, which is what are the consumers going to choose? And eventually, what at a certain point, once people choose it, does that make it, you know, for better or worse, the, the winner, you know? And, and I think you've seen that with like, you know, Windows and Microsoft not being the greatest operating system, but attracting the user base and, and being sort of the, uh, you know, enshrined as, as the go-to. And I'm wondering if you yeah, see you've got you got to ask yourself what, what, why, you know, what is the decentralization needed, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and the reason that sound money needs to have decentralization is because in money, um, you have, you know, you talk about those three things that we were talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. um, you've got, um, you know, the ability to own your own money, i.e. it's unconfiscatable, mm -hmm. the ability to spend your own money, um, i.e. censorship resistance, um, and the ability to not change or manipulate the money supply, i.e. unprintable. Mm -hmm. um, so you've got these three things, and therefore Bitcoin needs a massive amount of uh, decentralization because sound, you know, money is one of these things that always wants to be censored, always wants to be controlled, and always wants to be changed. Yep. Um, now, you've got to look at the other user case of, you know, does it need those things in order to achieve? Is there a massive amount of problem with censorship resistance, um, with uh, the ability to confiscate and seize the assets? or the ability to change a money supply. Well, what we saw with Ethereum um, is that actually it is problematic when uh, they can actually change and reverse the blockchain because that can screw up a lot of things that were built on top of it. So you've got to say, is that a problem for my specific use case? Mm -hmm. Well, if you're creating securities tokens, <clears throat> um, it probably is a, a problem if your security gets changed because someone else changed the protocol mm -hmm. or they had to hard fork it or something happened. Um, and then therefore you might need more decentralization, but that comes at a cost. Mm -hmm. It's going to have 
you know, um, it's not going to be as fast. It's not going to be, you know, there's, a, there's a cost benefit to all these things. Um, and it, it's really hard to know exactly where this, this whole thing is going to go next. But when you're building a use case, you've got to try and think about how important decentralization is. And if it's not important, then the fastest, cheapest, and best way of doing it is centralized. Uh, definitely, definitely agree with you there. And I believe personally that the, the next phase, the next era of blockchain uh, products, if you will, will will blend a centralized and decentralized uh, sort of servers behind them because uh, it's about uh, preserving the things that make it better and getting rid of the things that make it worse uh, as far as a user experience. Otherwise, no one's going to adopt it. Um, and I think this is a good time to transfer into now uh, what you're working on now, which is, I think, from what I can tell, heavily focused on securities tokens, uh, specifically uh, your platform, Bank to the Future. And so why don't you let us know a little bit about what you're very excited about now as far as uh, what, what might be coming up for the next year or two, specifically with security tokens or beyond? Yeah, so, um, you know, at Bank to the Future, as I said, we've, we've, our bread and butter has always been equity. We started on this uh, looking at securities laws in 2010, lobbying regulators to make changes. Um, and we've seen everything that's changed um, between, you know, where we are in the ICO and everything that happened then. Um, and so we were very fortunate to um, allow our investors um, to invest in, you know, over 100 of the, I mean, some of them have failed, but, you know, um, a great deal of the largest and most successful companies in crypto. And we possess equity in many of those companies. And so what we just launched um, is a secondary market. Um, and the secondary market is currently in beta, but it allows the people that invested in those crypto company equity to sell it to someone that missed the opportunity. Um, and it's obviously done within the realms of regula uh, regulation, who's allowed to invest, securities laws, and all the things that we need to comply with in order to allow that to actually happen. Um, but at the moment, we just launched um, Bitfinex, was one of our most successful investments. Um, and that's now uh, on our secondary market where qualifying investors can buy and sell those shares. Um, and it's all done through our, our, you know, our, our system, our SPV, and in compliance with the securities laws of where the, the user is actually from. Um, so can now, I, can I what, buy some Coinbase sure. shares yet? Um, you can't at this moment because we're in beta and we're only in beta with Bitfinex. Um, by the end of this year, we would like to have um, all of the major companies um, in this space that are household names. Um, and that's our, our roadmap of what, how we're going to do that. Yeah. Um, I, I know but, that if I could vote for two, I would say I would love to own stock in Coinbase and Ripple, the company, not XRP, the token, because Ripple has got a clearly bright future. And, and obviously, uh, I think XRP has a, a significant chance of being a, a strong player as well. But Ripple, for sure, uh, I think everyone would be clamoring at the chance to get some Ripple shares. Okay, well, thanks for that feedback. And we do own equity in both. Um, so you heard the, it, guys. Get ready, bank to the future. <laughs> um, and at the same time, what we're doing now is we just launched. So you know, we we launched a token for our ecosystem, which is the BF token. Mm -hmm. um, we did it during you know the the I think at the very beginning of the bear market in 2018. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, our token was designed to really you know allow people to get priority access to deals. Um, it was uh, also um, people that trade on our secondary market. They get 50% discounted trading fees. So we're trying to create a, an ecosystem much like Binance has um, in the traditional token cryptocurrency system. We're trying to do a, deliver a similar thing within the security token ecosystem. And we think we're ideally positioned to do that. Um, and yeah, we just launched um, actually this week uh, the BF wallet. Um, and as far as I know, it's the first wallet for security token. So um, people will be able to download the wallet. And what we're actually going to do eventually, the goal is we're taking our first use case, which is we did the security code token offering for lottery.com. Um, and uh, we're integrating with, we invested in Securitize, if you're familiar with that company, we're an equity holder there. And Securitize has created the protocol that allows you to launch security token. And we've integrated that into the wallet. Um, we took our first security token, which was lottery.com. Um, and uh, by going through the wallet, you can take those tokens, control your security, and then you'll be able to send those to other whitelisting partners, for example, um, Open Finance Platform, which is a, a registered broker dealer in ATS. 
exchange or T0, and we're integrating with these different partners um, to be able to do that and just really building ecosystem ultra early. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the goal is that you'll be able to, um, at some point in the future, either keep those um, you know, equity on the secondary market, and then we're iterating into the security token ecosystem. And so the wallet will be designed where you can go from equity in our centralized platform, which could be traded on our secondary market. You could tokenize it on the way out to the wallet. Um, if T0 in the future decides to list that security token, then you can choose your exchange and you can go to these different ecosystems um, and then come back in. And, you know, that's kind of the way we're, we're iterating. So because we've, you know, rather than building things that don't exist, we've got customers, we've got things that actually are working right now. And we're trying to iterate into that and see what benefits come from that. Can you um, buy, can you buy with fiat? Uh, on bank for the future, you can use dollars, you can use Bitcoin, you can use Ethereum, you can use an all coin. Um, we've integrated a lot of different parties there. Yeah. Awesome. Well, congrats, um, uh, congrats on the launch, man. We'll have to check out. I'll put over a little, uh, a little visual on on Banks of the Future Wallet here, and uh, congratulations on being on the forefront of what is sure to be an extremely, extremely, I guess, transformative change in the cryptocurrency atmosphere here. To have you know registered securities on the blockchain. I know personally, I've worked with a, a few companies that uh, real estate companies that were very interested in tokenizing their commercial real estate assets. Uh, do you, what do you see as being the killer? Uh, the killer uh, use case for securities tokens. Uh, do you see these traditional sort of stocks and private equity uh, holdings as that killer use case, or do you think that there is, uh, you know, quite a, a bright future for uh, real estate holdings uh, or other more traditional assets? Yeah. So well, I can talk for our niche. Our niche is that you know when we created Bank of Future and all we did, the books I wrote, all the thing I've worked on, is um, you know I believe that every single financial product is going to be changed by technology. Um, and we've tried to invest in the companies that are going to make those change. And our whole thing is reforming, transforming finance, being diversified across the whole transformation. And some of those companies are going to succeed and disrupt a multi-trillion dollar industry, and the others are all going to fail. And that's kind of what we did. So our particular niche at Bank for the Future is you're not going to come to Bank for the Future and see real estate investment opportunities. Our team is not qualified to analyze those opportunities. It's not our core competence. Um, you know, we're focused on private equity and financial technology. Um, so that's our particular thing. But saying that, we would certainly be investing in a company that is looking to bring that to market. And often you'll see on our platform, we bring opportunities that appear to be competitors to us, but we're looking at, you know, supporting the whole ecosystem because we're not necessarily. And so if you're asking for me, I, I have no idea um, whether tokenized property is going to be a thing. Um, I think it could be. Um, we do know that what we'll be focusing on and we'll be investing in the rest and looking to bring opportunities to diversify uh, because the one thing that I've learned is that I, you know, we kind of, I think I got it lucky and right on some of my core uh, principles about what I thought was wrong with banking. Um, But during that whole time, I've got lots wrong and I got some things right. Um, And I try not to second guess the market. I try to be diversified I try to keep up to date and I try to um, not get too close minded because I found that that can actually, um, you know, that can actually lead to, I, I've seen a lot of people that have been there for throughout the whole time uh, that we've been there that, you know, haven't actually benefited from any of those waves mm-hmm. uh, simply because they had a very close mind perspective and very strong opinion. And when evidence you know, proves otherwise, um, they ignore that. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I think it's uh, it's quite easy to do that. Um, but uh, sometimes the market will tell you whether you're wrong or right. And sometimes you've got to adjust to the market. Um, and so I try I try and just be take a, take a rounded approach to that. So I think one of the most important things that you said just there was that even you as an expert, you know, a former investment banker and someone who is, you know, a, an original uh, Bitcoin proponent and has seen the movement evolve, wouldn't feel comfortable analyzing a real estate investment because that's not your core competency. And I think that's kind of the the situation that STOs will present is you should really only be buying these if you truly understand these assets and the underlying you know, frameworks around these assets. If you understand you know, uh, private equity in, in developing crypto or tech companies, 
then you should consider investing in STOs there. But just because you have access to a real estate investment or a, a security token that represents equity in a different company doesn't mean that that's necessarily anywhere you should even consider investing because you actually are going to be investing against true experts and your ability to determine what that right price for that asset would be is probably going to be very difficult for you to, uh, to, to determine that. Beyond that, you don't have the chance of making, you know, 5,000% returns, you're probably going to make much more modest returns, but could potentially lose quite a bit of money. So I, I think it's very interesting that you uh, would say that you wouldn't even venture to analyze these real estate uh, investments. And I think that's something that I kind of wanted to hammer home about just STOs in general. So thanks for that. Um, but yeah, obviously, very exciting times. What do you think is the most exciting thing happening right now in cryptocurrency? Uh, what would you leave our audience with if you were to leave them with some closing thoughts as to what you would want them to be focusing on, thinking about uh, in sort of early, mid-2019? Yeah, well, um, I'm still most excited about the thing that I was most excited about in the beginning, and that is Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. um, I still believe that while we've had all of these ultra-high return ultra speculative, ultra risky opportunities of creating disruption in many other areas. I still think that, you know, I go back to my principles and what wakes me up every morning is that this group of 40 people that were sat in a room, you know, uh, using their anarchy experience and their uh, computer science experience have actually created, I think, the, the very thing that might have the most amount of change in the world. Um, and I think the ability to transition and have a sound monetary system and the ability to own your own money and spend your own money is still the most exciting thing. Um, I think the fact that we've had so much technological innovation, we've had these scaling debates, um, and now we've got things like liquid, liquid networks and lightning networks, which, you know, very they're very small in terms of adoption at the moment, um, but they're very exciting in terms of the potential. And when we see, you know, um, Jack from um, uh, Twitter, who's invested in Lightning Labs and looking to push adoption. Um, when we see, so I, I'm at the Satoshi Roundtable in Mexico right now, and um, you've got you know a lot of the, the, the important people building in this industry. Um, you've got the on-chain scaling, you've got layer two scaling, and everyone's building to get ready for the next bull run to be able to onboard these people. And then you've got financial institutions, which are just, uh, the, the, the shift I've seen in these financial institutions is tremendous. Um, I remember when we were first pitching Bitcoin, it was a scam, it was a Ponzi scheme, it was something to laugh at, it was a currency for drug dealers, it was something to be mocked. Um, now these, and then they tried to defensively take the word Bitcoin out and use the word blockchain. And then they tried to patent it and build their own thing called distributed ledger technology. But now what they're all building for is Bitcoin, which is a tremendous shift. They're saying everything else is too risky. Um, we haven't seen anything come out of it. We can't actually, you know, create custodial solutions for Ethereum and Tron and all that stuff. Um, now we want to launch cryptocurrency exchanges for Bitcoin. We want to launch custodial solutions for Bitcoin. We want to launch um, products where pension fund managers can come in and invest in Bitcoin. And that's all being built. Now, I still believe in the two, there's a two-tiered market. There's, you need to onboard through fiat into those, you know, responsible, regulated products, traditional ways. Um, but then hopefully you will learn and you'll learn how to get a hardware wallet, take care of your personal security. Um, and before that system collapses, have the ability to own your own money, spend your own money and really have the freedom and sovereignty that this industry actually promised to begin with. And I think we are at the very beginning of it. Um, it's the most exciting time to be alive in financial history. The people that are around right now in the bear market, the podcasters, the content creators, the people that are here now, are the people you probably want to be listening to because there's going to be a lot of people that will come during the, the, the bull market. Um, but the ones that are actually here building right now, ready for scaling, you know, I personally seen my $30 Bitcoin crash to $3, my $1,250 Bitcoin crash to $250, my 20,000 Bitcoin crash to $3,000. And I'm sure I'm going to see my $100,000 Bitcoin crash to $20,000 as we uh, transition to you know, bring in this sound monetary policy and all the disruption that comes with that as we create this product that exists outside of the financial system that ends up regulating the regulator, creating things more honest, um, and transitioning into a world where 
Um, you know, if the, every single financial product is right out there for the disruption. And I just think it's such an exciting time to be alive and, and be a part of it. It's a real privilege. Well, you heard it yourself. Buy Bitcoin and watch FUD TV, guys. Thank you so much for uh, your time. I really appreciate you coming on. Uh, really incredibly deep well of knowledge and, of course, just a, an original Bitcoin proponent. Who could want any more? I really appreciate your time and effort and contributions to the space. Simon Dixon, everybody, thank you so much. Thank you. And creating content is a very important thing to do because there's a lot of education that's needed in this industry. So keep creating. Thank you, man. A big thank you to Simon for coming on the channel. If you enjoyed it, go ahead and hit that like button. And of course, let us know what you think in the comment section below. As usual, I'm Elio Trades. You're watching FUD TV. And I will see you very soon on the next episode.